Okay, power in the blood. There is power in the blood. Yeah, yeah, so the man said, fill, fill, yep. 
That's every area. Good. Okay, so we're going to move on this week and this morning. Our uh, fifth lesson. We're going to look at uh, speaking in tongues. Fifth lesson, speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues is definitely a very important part of this series because it's possibly the part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit around which the most controversy and confusion revolves. Now, we've obviously studied this in, in different settings. I've preached on this, so a lot of this may not be new for you if you've been this is something that you've thought about, paid attention to, but uh, maybe for some of you it will be, and for others it will kind of solidify uh, the doctrine of speaking in tongues. And so, uh, ever since I have entered into the ministry, this is always something that I get lots of questions about. Uh, people are, you know, they get saved, and then they have questions, or somebody in their life begins to question them about speaking in tongues. So hopefully this will... Uh, provide uh, some more resources to you and also help you understand what speaking in tongues is all about. So let's get some scriptures. Uh, if you want to read, lift your hand. We'll give you a scripture. Yeah. Well. Leland, you're going to read our main scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And then Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, Adrian, Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Leanne, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the second time. Aileen, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 46. Jeremy, Acts chapter 19, verse 6. Michelle, Acts chapter 8, verse 17 through 19. Uh, Jeff, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the third time. Sylvia, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Anybody else want to read? I can give you a scripture if you want to read. Crucita, uh, Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Mercy, Acts chapter 2, verse 13. We'll stop there. Let's go on a little bit. Okay. So our series, we are looking at the Holy Spirit primarily in the New Testament. Uh, and in the book of Acts. The book of Acts should really be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's all about what the Spirit of God does in the church. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring God's power to your life personally. And so as we go through the book of Acts, we are doing a side-by-side -side comparison. My life and what the Holy Spirit is doing in these people in the book of Acts. And is there uh, the, the same evidence, the same signs? So today, we're going to look at the purpose and the power of speaking in tongues. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, Leland, real loud, so we all can hear this one. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak anew in other tongues, and the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so the first thought this morning is the timing and evidence of speaking in tongues. The timing and evidence of speaking in tongues. Let's first consider the timing, the timing of speaking in tongues. When does someone receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's an important question because the Bible talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The question is, when does this happen? When should this happen? A common objection of tongues is the idea that we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. And so the argument goes something like this. Well, you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit, and uh, you didn't speak in tongues, therefore there's nothing more that you should be seeking. Um, so expecting anything else is unnecessary according to this understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, what is always critical in life and especially in Christianity is we don't just we don't just make up things. We don't just 
decide we believe something. You have to go to the Word of God for the pattern. That is what matters. And when we're discussing specifically the Church and the Holy Spirit, the Book of Acts is one of the most critical books in the entire Bible. The Book of Acts provides a blueprint, a pattern for the entire age of the church. Now, I'm going to explain this quickly, and hopefully it, 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 that that is the Book of Acts, and, and, and we, you know, yes, unfortunately, we are unique, but that's not, that first of all, it's not because we're trying to be unique, you know, you ever, you ever met Christians that's obvious they're trying to be unique? You know, they have some weird, bizarre doctrine that they were like, yeah, we're the only ones that do this. Well, there's probably a reason because it's weird, but right? it's not in the Bible. That's why you're doing that. Uh, but, but, you know, the purpose is that we're trying to be unique. And the good thing is there, there are other churches out there that are close to this. Uh, unfortunately, it's becoming more and more rare. And I would say, in my experience, our fellowship is probably the, the, the largest movement I've encountered that has stuck to this, uh, but yeah, it, we are we are playing out the book of Acts. We are following it to the best of our ability. Does that mean we don't have problems? Of course not. Uh, those things have to be worked through. There's imperfections. There's people that go off the deep end. There's problems, rebellions, false doctrines, false doctrines that creep in. But to the best of our ability, uh, I, as far as I can tell, we have we have stuck pretty close to the pattern of the book of Acts. But who else? Yeah. So I, I just thank God for our fellowship and the order, you know what I mean, when we speak of tongues and all that, because I've been witnessing uh, to people, I had a couple of weird ones, man, where I was asking this lady one time if she saved, and she said, yeah, yeah, I'm a tongue talker, and then she starts spatting off all kinds of crazy stuff, and I'm like, what are you, I'm like, well, praise God, I'll, I'll just go to the next person, you know, and just, and people are weird, bro, like, I mean, you just, I don't know, they're, they're just crazy. Yeah, but I think so, so they, 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 they were they were describing the two the two imbalances when it comes to the Holy Spirit, right? The one is uh, extreme and bizarre manifestations that you don't find anywhere in the Bible, uh, and, and you can, we can talk about the whole morning about strange strange <laughs> things that happen uh, having to do with with Pentecostalism. On the other side is a reaction to the weird, right? Which is because there are some weird people out there that do it wrong, let's not do it at all. And so then the overreaction, which is actually far more common today, is either very limited or none at all. Let's just do away with it. Because there are weird people, let's do away with it. That's also incorrect. Both of those imbalances are not helpful. you got to stick to the pattern that's in the Bible. Good. Okay, let's think secondly then about the purpose of speaking in tongues. The big question this morning is why? Why tongues? Uh, in other words, you know, God could have chosen anything to be the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why would he choose tongues at all? Um, now, no, we're not talking about the benefit of what tongues does right now. What we're talking about is the reasoning behind it. So let's think about some of the reasons of why uh, tongues would be uh, involved in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, speaking in tongues is a sign of surrender. It's a sign of surrender. The essence of human sin is pride and self-will. Those two things, pride and self-will. In other words, I want to be in control. You look at the Garden of Eden, what does the serpent tell you? You shall be as God. So, salvation does the opposite. Because sin is pride and self-will, salvation involves humility and surrender. The opposite of sin. And this plays out all throughout salvation. And we can apply it when we talk about speaking in tongues. You know, you know who really despises speaking in tongues? People who feel they are cultured and educated in spiritual things. In other words, they have a sense of religious pride. And like I've been telling you guys, I've been reading about some of the Pentecostal revivals in history. 
And one of the interesting things is most of the time, Pentecostal revival has flourished in the lower tiers or lower echelons of society. In other words, like when there was the great Pentecostal movements happening in, in the early 1900s and the 1950s, you know what it was? It was poor people. It was people that were oppressed by society, uh, people of color. It, and, and there was a great move of God. Part of why it wasn't the higher tiers of society was because these people had the attitude of like, I want to be in control. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to look that way. One of my favorite stories about the early days in our fellowship is Pastor Mitchell preaching to the Prescott Church, which at that time was like, you know, all these crazy young hippies, right? Hippies, these were people that didn't shower, had long, greasy hair, uh, you know, had all sorts of strange problems. You know, they're, they're bringing their dogs to church. It was a wild thing. And there was a girl who got saved, a teenage girl. She witnessed to her parents, right? She, she's hooked on drugs, she's a freak. She gets powerfully saved. Her parents who are like good upper class Christian people, right? They're so shocked by their rebellious daughter that gets saved. They go, we have to go to the potter's house and see what's happening at that church. Mom was a Sunday school teacher, the dad, he was the president of the golf club, I think. And they came to church and they're sitting, you know, just imagine this, right? You, you've got a church full of teenagers and 20 year olds that are just crazy, out of their mind, all brand new Christians, just, you know, sitting on the floor, singing, you know, uh, be, being the way it was in those days. And then you have, you know, the president of the golf club. And he comes and he's sitting down. Pastor Mitchell pulls the altar call. You know, God's spirit is obviously there. It's anointed. And this couple gets convicted. They lift their hand to get saved. So Pastor Mitchell says, you lifted your hand. I want you to come to the front. And they will not stand up. In other words, we're not getting up in front of these people and admit that we have a problem? No, 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 no. That's embarrassing. We're not like these people. And so Pastor Mitchell, what he said was, this went on for about a month because he refused to pray for them. He said, I won't pray for you unless you come to the front. And he said every service, they would lift their hands, they wouldn't come to the front, and he wouldn't pray for them because they wouldn't do it. In other words, they needed to humble themselves. And so I think finally, after like a month, they finally came down and got saved. And uh, for those of you who would know them, the girl who got saved, the teenager, this is Pastor Kevin Foley's wife, Janet Foley. Her parents were Phil and Pat Payson. Phil Payson was the one, I think, he originally came up with the idea of doing the trumpet magazine, recording sermons. Pat Payson was in charge of the media ministry for years and years in the Prescott Church. But here, here's one of the principles, right? Is salvation is about surrender and humility. And this is why so often those who think that they are cultured and educated, they want to resist things like the doctrine of tongues. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. Something that is going to put to shame the wise. In other words, people that they are full of pride and religious arrogance, they don't want to do that. They don't want to speak in tongues. What? It's, it's kind of weird. I, I feel out of place. I don't like church to be like that. I want to control it. God has designed an outward sign of humility and surrender, and that's speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues involves a relinquishing, first of all, of understanding. Of understanding. Wait, but, okay, how should it sound? I don't know. Okay, how am I going to hear it? I don't know. But it, is God just going to make it? I don't know. It involves relinquishing understanding and relinquishing control, right? Is actually going, God, I'm surrendering to you. I'm not going to be in control. You are. Well, Pastor, what am I saying? I don't know. It's a heavenly language. I don't understand it, neither do you. 
And anybody who claims to understand it all the time, we have a special place for you in the back. <laughs> I don't want to be out of control or look foolish. Yeah, you've got to humble yourself. Opening ourselves to speaking in tongues is an outward sign of surrender. Right? We come to church, we lift our hands, and we praise God. What is that? It's a sign of surrender. So is speaking in tongues. It's an outward sign of a heart attitude, which is, God, I recognize that you are above me. You are in charge. You are in control. I don't understand everything. I don't have to understand everything, and I'm not in control. Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. To whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Okay, so here's an Old Testament prophecy of the Holy Spirit. With stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. There is divine communication involved in tongues. It also brings judgment to those who despise or reject. You know, I, 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 I do believe that God will hold every Christian and especially every Christian leader accountable that opposes the doctrine of tongues. I mean, can you, can you imagine? Here is the gift. Here's the one that Jesus prophesied about. I'm going to send the promise of my Father. Jesus is obviously excited about this because I'm telling you, this is what you're going to need, guys. This is it. It's going to give you power. This is going to be it. And then there are there are Christians and Christian leaders today who oppose the very thing that, that Jesus was saying. This is what we need. Most of all, in this world that is so full of sin, you're going to need power. And there are people that criticize it, object to it, resist it. Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Others, Martin said, these men are full of the white. Okay, here on the day of Pentecost, there, there were people that objected. Uh, objections to the Holy Spirit are nothing new. I know some of you may be quite shocked when there are people that say, you know, people in your family or people you know or other Christians, ah, oh, tongue, and then they start to get into this thing. It's nothing new. It happened on the day of Pentecost, too. Right? Others said they are full of new wine. Oh, those are weird people who are drunk. That's what's going on. That's not God. Uh, but this is something that actually brings judgment. It draws a line uh, on those who uh, or despise or reject it. So the second purpose then is that speaking in tongues is direct connection to God. John 14, 16 and 17. Can I give that up? No? There we stop? Okay, let's get some questions. That scripture there, John 14, 16, and 17. Uh, Leanne, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. Jeremy, James chapter 3, verse 6. Michelle, James chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Saravina, Acts chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Heaven, Romans 8, verse 26. Adrian, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14. Leland, Jude, chapter 1, verse 20. Sophia, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. Jeff, John, chapter 16, verse 13. Okay, so, the second reason or purpose of speaking in tongues is a direct connection to God in the name John 14, 16, and 7. And I will pray the Father, he, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because they neither see him nor know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, so this is all in the context of the promise of the Holy Spirit Jesus says, he's the spirit of truth. The world does not see him or know him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. That is talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is like a direct connection to God. The world doesn't know God. 
But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it gives you a direct connection to God. When someone's baptized with the Spirit, they are filled with the Spirit. In other words, there's direct connection. There's this integration almost of us and God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks in mysteries. Okay, so this is uh, explaining. He who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. This means you are able to speak directly to God. Speaking in tongues is so powerful because it bypasses human limitations of speech. How many know? A lot of times, the English language simply is not enough. Uh, there are times, you know, there are people that say, "Well, I'm not a good speaker." You know, the good news is, when you speak in tongues, it bypasses all of that. There are times when there's just simply not the right words. Speaking in tongues bypasses all of that. It bypasses emotion. You're able to have a direct connection to God. Second, God is able to speak directly to you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is a heightened level, we could say, of communication from God. He reveals truth. He gives wisdom. He gives direction. He gives strategy for life. Third, it's God's power inside of us and flowing through us. His power is activated by speaking in tongues. So it's a direct connection to God. Third, and finally, the purpose is that speaking in tongues is a sign of redemption. Redemption. A big part of salvation is redemption, which is God purchasing us from the power of sin. It's the idea of slavery, right? That sin owned us. And then Jesus came in, purchased us with his blood, and we are bought from the power of sin. Sin ruled over us, and this is, this is part of what speaking in tongues demonstrates is the power of redemption. Watch, listen to this scripture. James chapter 3, verse 6. And the blood is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Okay, so that's an interesting scripture about the tongue. And it's talking about the power of sin in somebody's life. And, and, and he mentions a few things. He says it's a world of iniquity. Uh, how, how many know sinners talk like sinners, don't they? It comes out of their mouth. It is, I mean, from lying to uh, manipulation to hurting people with their mouth to foul language to perversion. It, it, sin has power over the tongue when sin is ruling in the human uh, heart. But then it also says there in that scripture, it says it is set on fire by hell. Look there again. It's set on fire by hell. In other words, here, here's this horrible picture of the human being like being controlled almost. There's this dominion that hell has when sin is reigning in the human personality. It goes even further. James 3, verse 4 and 5. Look also at ships. Although they are Okay, talking about the power of the tongue. Now, what's very interesting is the connection here between the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, the tongue under sin, horrible thing, set on fire by hell. The day of Pentecost, what happened? Is God set the tongue on fire. In other words, here's a sign of redemption. This one is mine. It doesn't belong to sin. And, and it talks about Interesting, isn't it? Winds and fire. The very same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. A wind blew through the house. The sound of a rushing mighty wind. Tongues of fire sat upon each of them. In other words, here's God making this state. Here's a mark of redemption. This one is mine. The tongue that, in other parts of James, it says no one can control the tongue. 
He says, because of redemption, I'm giving power. That there's going to be, this is the evidence of redemption. It's involved right there. Speaking in tongues reverses the curse of, of Babel. We read about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 6. And it talks about how God brings judgment upon mankind for their sin and, and their pride. And what does he do? He confuses language and divides. So language divided people. But what happens on Pentecost is they're not divided anymore. They are united. Speaking in tongues was something that reached across language and cultural barriers. I love Pastor Heinberg's sermon at the rally because... In essence, this is part of what he was saying. No matter the things that divide people, the power of the Holy Spirit will reach across those divides and touch people. Acts chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look at not all these who speak Gentiles, and how is that we hear each in our own language and which we Okay, so now it's uniting across languages and nationalities. This is the purpose of tongues. Okay, let's open up there for questions or comments. The purpose of speaking in tongues, Jeremy. Does, uh, you know how some churches, they bark like dogs, they jump on the floor. Do you think that kind of uh, pushes uh, churches away from it? Well, yeah, that, that, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the imbalances, right? People who go too far this way, the... The, the natural human's response is to go back too far the other way. The pendulum swings. However, both of those are incorrect. So, it's like, okay, you know, the problem is you could use that with all of life, couldn't you? Right? Well, there are drunk drivers. That's why I never drive a car. You know, use it for anything. You know, there's people who overeat. That's why I'm not going to eat any food. There's people who exercise too much. That's why I'm never going to exercise. So you can't you can't use somebody else's excess or or their irresponsibility as an ex excuse to be irresponsible yourself, right? And to go so far the other way. And so yes, that is the reasoning behind it. But I adamantly oppose uh, I adamantly oppose that response because, like I said, you could use it for anything. This is this is actually, and this is the sad thing. Many of the pastors who have done this. They, they speak out against people who do this in their own church in a way like this, you know, is they have people in their church that go, I'm not going to your church anymore because so-and-so is a gossip. And no doubt, those pastors have told that person, no, 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 you, that just because they're doing wrong doesn't mean you should do wrong. You, you shouldn't leave just because they're, and then now they're doing the same thing, right? Because someone else is doing wrong, they're going to be imbalanced to go all the way this way. You can't use somebody else's uh, incorrections as a excuse or a justification for you to also be incorrect the other way, right? So how would you talk to someone like that? Actually? No, no, this is, this is spiritual. Yeah. This is spiritual. And, and when you're dealing with somebody who resists, uh, when it comes to doctrine, what I, what I, you know, part of the purpose in these, and I hope you guys understand, my purpose in doing Sunday schools like this is my job as a pastor is I am to equip the congregation. So I'm giving you things that equip you and protect you spiritually. Uh, but don't, don't think that, you know, this is somehow you're going to be able to go and win arguments with people with this. Is, sure, there may be people that have an open door. You can reason with them. But if you've ever talked to somebody who's bought into false doctrine, what you find out is it's not a common sense thing. You can show them all the screen. You can go, look, right there it says that. Right here it says this. Right there it says that. Right? And then you'll get to the end and they'll say, the exact same thing they said at the beginning. Well, I just still struggle to believe it. But, okay, this isn't about the mind. It's not about whether it's true or not. Error is a spirit. And that, that's so important because, you know, you have to understand God has to open the eyes of these people. You know, and, and no doubt, we all know people at various levels that, that have embraced false doctrine. Error is a spirit. And really, it originates with Lucifer, the original one, who twisted the truth, departed from the truth, and so the problem is, it's a spiritual thing. And you don't, you don't, you don't defeat error by, you know, this is, a, this is why I'm not big on the whole, you know, uh, 
creationist movement, and they, you know, they have these big conferences. I'm going to debate, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, and I'm going to prove to him how the level of evolution is true, and that there's evidence for God in the universe. I'm sorry, if you can look at the universe and come to the conclusion that there is no God, you have a deeper problem than mental problem. This is, this is not a brain thing. It is so obvious. Design is absolutely obvious. If you dis deny, if you deny intelligent design, you are insane. But the thing is, the people, they're not denying it on the basis of intellect. It's on the basis of their heart. It's a spiritual thing. And so that is true in any type of error. So, uh, yeah, how would you talk to them? Well, most importantly, you have to pray for them. You have to pray for them. Sure, maybe, maybe you'll sense a season of openness where they become open, and then you can reason with them to some degree. But at the end of the day, it is a, it is a heart issue. Most often, and I'll just put this out there, most often, I would say there's two important spiritual matters when it comes to stuff like this. The first is pride. Religious pride is a powerful thing. Powerful thing. You know, you have people they will die on a battlefield of uh, battle a battlefield of religious pride because they will not admit they're wrong. Religious pride. It's the Pharisees to the to God Himself. Right? Jesus is there. You guys are wrong. No, we're not. We're going to kill you. That's religious pride. That's what it does. It is powerful stuff. And, and, and you could spell it all out. You could show them. You could prove it. Look, here's what the words mean. Da, 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 da. And nothing can change when someone will not humble themselves. The second issue is demonic deception. So with false doctrine and false religion, there are demon spirits involved. Now, I'm not saying these people are demon-possessed. What I'm saying is the Bible talks about doctrines of demons. In other words... Hell is smart. They, the demonic conjures up twistings of the truth in order to get people off track. So, but there is a demonic deception. Again, that's why you, know, you try with people with false religion, right? You know, I, I've, I've done it before, which is a total waste of time. I was probably not in a good place in my life. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, my wife has watched me. I've sat down with the, uh, you know, the 21-year-old the Mormon elders and uh, proved them wrong. You know, look, right here, blah, 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 blah. Nothing, you know, it's demonic deception. They have to be healed of it. Serbina? Um, so I was, like, raised in a Christian home. Yeah. Yep. And I was raised in a Christian home. Interpreted, we don't just let people keep going on in tongues. That's that's the whole point of Corinthians. Is Paul says, no, if someone's going to speak in tongues by themselves, then it needs to be interpreted. Otherwise, this is just chaos. What's the point? It's all just sitting there listening to people speaking in tongues at different points by their, by themselves. Nobody's getting the nature of that. He said, but then he talks about the other kinds of tongues, and uh, this is the tongue that's for every believer, right? These signs will follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick. They'll speak with other tongues. You go through the book of Acts, it's all throughout there. And yeah, that is why it's avoided, because it's a it's a touchy thing, and it's something that people, uh, uh, you know, in entire movements, they have been kind of indoctrinated away from this. Okay, so good questions and comments, guys. We kind of, uh, we kind of ran over time, so I'm going to just leave you with a few simple points, which we're not really able to do, explore this for the sake of time. But the final idea blessing of speaking in tongues. And so, we talked about the purpose. Now, what do tongues do? First of all, it gives you power for prayer and praise. 
This is what will make your prayer and your praise life powerful. It's being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is why we contend for a powerful praise service. You know, I'll be very honest with you. We are not, this is not a... We, 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 we praise and we pray, and we are not worried about volume. We're not worried about volume. And the, when they got filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, people could hear them. How? Because they were downstairs. We know that because they were, it says, they heard them. So they were being loud. In other words, they weren't doing this. They, they, they got filled and they were loud. So we're not worried about, uh, there, there is there's a powerful dimension. Now, I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm not talking about trying to conjure this up. But the point is, it animates prayer and praise. It also builds you up as a Christian. Builds up your faith. And believe it or not, there are actually physical and mental benefits. You can look up some of this. The doctors have released entire studies about how speaking in tongues boosts your immune system. Uh, and, and no doubt there's more than that. Uh, but I can give you some of that information if you're more interested in We're out of time. We're going to have church at 10 30.